Let them start now. Right thing that Tim, you can go ahead and mute them all. Welcome, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Vance, Tad, Jeannie, Mance, and Eli. How are you doing? Good to see everybody Hi. here. So, um, welcome. Uh, as you all know, I'm Bill Sproul, I'm the CEO of Tech Titans, and it's my pleasure to have with me today Nicholas Hoveldop, who is the president and CEO of. Erickson North America, and he is our Tech Titans CEO of the year. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for the award. Very humbling. Well, you know, uh, you and I both have uh, these trophies. You've got a new shiny one right behind you. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you mean they were stuff. out? They're not as shiny? Oh, you know, I take mine out occasionally. I polish it. Yep. So, Beautiful. hey, Dr. Benson, how are you? Good to see you. Glad others are joining. I'm good. Where's your uh, Where's your bow tie, Bill? Oh, wow. Uh, you know that uh, uh, that comes on later at 3:45. <laughs> but thank you for dressing up. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, great. I'm getting the right spirit here. Absolutely. Well, you know, and you'll make that uh, cocktail that bees knees here in a while, and you'll be really feeling the mood. That's good. So uh, we've got some precious time here with uh, Nicholas and. Um, Nicholas, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing some of your precious time with us. I know how busy you are being CEO of the Erickson North America. And, um, you know, as I told you, our judges were extremely impressed with um, what you've been doing and have done since you became CEO. Would you just talk a little bit about your leadership and results since you became CEO and maybe a little background on, on you? Sure. Well, thanks. And first and foremost, thank you to all the Tech Titan member companies. Without you and your contributions in the area, none of this would have been possible. But uh, so I basically joined the group executive team in 2016, uh, and we were pretty much a turnaround case at the time. We had spread ourselves too thin, and we were really challenged, losing market share and struggling uh, with some pretty aggressive competitors. Uh, our CEO, uh, group CEO, was let go that summer. I had just relocated from Dallas back to Stockholm. And uh, we brought in a new CEO, a former board member of ours, Barry, who is now the group CEO. And we spent quite some time uh, during late 2016, early 2017, trying to figure out where we had gone wrong. And we spent a lot of time uh, traveling and talking to customers, of course. And there is going to be no Harvard case study uh, written about our findings, because that was pretty straightforward. We had spread ourselves too thin. We were trying to do too much in too many different businesses at the same time with too little money. And we realized that we had started to compromise on R&D investments in our core business. And we were also uh, trying to enter new markets, new verticals uh, at the same time. So of course, a recipe for failure. And uh, so again, no genius. Uh, the realization was pretty straightforward. And we launched a new strategy already uh, with, I think, three months in uh, early April 2017. And it was a focus strategy. And the, the, the big difference is really that we spent a lot of time on deciding what we're not going to do so we could fund our core business properly. And uh, fast forward, uh, we made a couple of really smart decisions. We uh, decided to invest early ahead of our competition in 5G. So when the market started turning, uh, we were in a really good position. And we had also then focused our investments in our uh, core business and our key customers. So that part wasn't really genius because you would probably pick up that in most Harvard case studies. The execution, however, uh, I think was phenomenal. And the way we together in the new leadership team drove this across, across the company, across the globe. I was heading up strategy and technology and emerging businesses at the time. And then our head in North America at the time decided to leave and she went to work for one of our customers. And since I had just returned to Sweden from Dallas, uh, I was asked to go back to the U.S. and head up our operations in North America. Since most of the early deployments were going to be in the U.S., so the U.S. was going to be really the, call it the, the, 
key market for our turnaround. We were doing about 25% of our business in North America at the time. And we knew that we had to catch the big 5G wave early in the US to turn the group around. The momentum was really gonna be here in North America. So I relocated back to the US, uh, commuting to Sweden uh, during a year actually, since I had to leave my family behind until they could then eventually move back over. And uh, we managed to time it really well. And what we did, I think, exceptionally well is that we stayed really close to our customers so that we could mobilize our R&D to really hit the sweet spot of what their requirements were. So we really managed to bring our customers back into the R&D machine, delivering on their expectations. So the first uh, deployments in the US were all powered by Ericsson. As a matter of fact, for the first six months of the 5G deployments between uh, Q4 2018 and mid 2019, the only networks being built in the US were delivered by Ericsson. So we really timed it ex exceptionally well uh, and listening to our customers and really mobilizing our full R&D strength to deliver on the US domestic needs for our, for our lead customers. We also, uh, I think part lucky, uh, decided about the same time frame that we were gonna uh, strengthen some of our investments in the US. So we built a center of excellence to train tower technicians, which we knew was a scarce resource. And uh, we do that in Louisville, Texas as well, uh, where we train tower crews. So we have recruited and uh, hired uh, probably 800 during last year alone, certified tower climbers. It's also a nice collaboration in hiring veterans that actually have proven uh, to be exceptionally well prepared to deal with climbing in, in towers. So that has been an important contribution, I think, to the North Texas uh, hub, but also to the North American 5G rollout. And then we decided to build a factory, a brand new factory in Louisville, Texas, a smart factory using our own technology, which we then actually opened in uh, early 2020, in the middle of the corona crisis. The decisions were made long before but our ability to come into North America and get really close to our customers as the only OEM actually producing equipment in the US also proved out to be pretty genius because now we could turn around their requirements much faster. And uh, of course, uh, this has been a, a crazy year. So I think the fact that we managed to open the factory in the middle of the Corona crisis, uh, that could actually be a Harvard case study at some point because <laughs> we could not send our new hires to Sweden for training or Estonia where we have another smart factory and we couldn't fly in any technicians either. So we actually had to use uh, uh, virtual reality cameras for our technicians in the factory to uh, remotely get trained by technicians in Estonia on the equipment that we were just basically building in the factory. So an incredible achievement by the team to get the factory up and running and actually deliveries started already in March of this year. So it's been a, an incredible three to four year period. Uh, business wise, we have seen uh, uh, incredible growth, double digit now for three years running. And we have increased our market share from 46% in early 2016 to 53% today, to the, according to Deloro. So in spite of new competitors entering the market, we have been able to, to grow faster than the market, which has been a remarkable achievement by the team. And back to the, your opening question on leadership, I think one of the uh, important realizations and that has actually proven hugely successful for us is that uh, we knew that we were not really listening well enough to our customers. And we knew that we had a lot of inefficiencies in the organization. I used to say that we uh, used to do a lot of uh, crazy, stupid shit, uh, complicated processes, bad tools. And you can sit there in the executive chamber and you can do your modeling, you can bring in consultants, you can look at all of that. At the end of the day, the best judges are the employees. So we decided to put it back on our employees and give them a license basically to go and hunt those stupid inefficiencies that were wearing them down and to stay close to their customers. So we started a grassroots cultural movement all around action and execution. And we gave our employees <clears throat> the freedom to speak up, to bring up the ideas, to run with them, to break some glass. Uh, and that has uh, been an incredible journey. And I mean, I've been in leadership positions now for 27 years. Uh, 
and I, I had never tried an experiment of this magnitude with 10,000 employees, um, but I can of course stand here today and say that that has been uh, probably one of the best bets I've ever made as a, as a leader. Still learning every day, but this has been incredible to see the response in the organization, how we then, by simply providing some boundary conditions, have seen employees step up and just run with it. And it's been an incredible inspiration, I think, for all of us. And uh, we are now uh, building on this cultural movement across the globe, actually. And it's uh, in big part uh, challenging the way it has always been, bringing the initiative back to employees. But there has also been uh, an important element of uh, uh, giving back uh, and fighting some of the injustices that, of course, many of us have come to experience here in the U.S. and the employees have stepped up. And just like for many of you, probably, you have a lot of next generation uh, employees, young employees joining your company, and they want to believe in a bigger purpose. And I think uh, we have been able to give them a purpose and we have been able to engage them in some of these Injustices, be it uh, bridging the digital divide, which has become painfully, painfully obvious, even in the U.S., 37% of rural American kids don't have access to broadband, 21% in urban America. I, I was unaware until the, the crisis hit, really, and we started seeing those injustices really being accentuated. So that, of course, gets our employees engaged, motivated, because we can work with those kind of uh, uh, call it digital divide gaps because we provide solutions to that. So that has given us, uh, I guess, another purpose during the crisis, working and supporting first responders and healthcare professionals uh, and sort of keeping America running. We've had a, a nice campaign again, in grassroots initiated, that has, uh, during these tough times, given our employees uh, a big purpose. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause there and open up for some questions, but... Um, I hope uh, what you take away is that uh, I, I'm merely here representing an incredible organization with a lot of great leaders and incredibly talented people that uh, and I don't even know who nominated me. Somebody put me forward there. <laughs> but it's a really testimony to the, our employees, but also to Tech Titans and the work you do in the tech corridor, the work you do with them, giving us an opportunity to recruit top talent, but also collaborate with the other member companies. So again, I'm very humble about the fact that I happen to stand here uh, this year. It could be any of your member CEOs. Where I think we all benefit from the vibrant uh, environment in the area. Nicholas, thanks so much. Great story. And, uh, I'm getting some feedback there, maybe. I'll mute. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. It, it, it's understandable why you got selected as CEO of the year. Well, we've got some interesting people here, some of whom you know, like Barbara Baffer from Ericsson. And I hope that you know Car Karthik Subramanian. Karthik, uh, we worked with him on our 5G Grand Challenge that I told you about previously. And Karthik's really brilliant and a hard worker, and uh, he deserves a raise. So <laughs> I'll just put that in for him. Um, but I'm going to ask some people to introduce themselves. And I know that uh, Dr. Dick Benson, Richard Benson, the president of University of Texas at Dallas um, is, uh, you know, leading a, a huge university that's STEM focused and uh, producing a lot of uh, uh, graduates that are employed by Erickson. Uh, Dr. Benson, uh, you want to take a moment to introduce yourself and just to ask a question or make a comment about UT Dallas? Uh, sure, Bill. Uh, thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Um, you know, I've been at UTD for four years now. I'm in my in my fifth year. Um, been a strange year. <laughs> but, um, you know, we've been the nation's second fastest growing university, at least over a 10 year period. Now, <laughs> you've got to put a big asterisk on year 2020. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of young folks and maybe not so young folks are choosing UTD for their education. Um, I will say that we were created a little over 50 years ago by the people who had founded a TI because at the time they were struggling to hire the, the high tech talent that they needed. And, and that's still true today. And so they had this brilliant concept, which is to create this university, which they uh, labeled would become the MIT of the Southwest. And, but the fact is we really have kept that STEM focus. And I'd like to point out, we have two M's in our STEM, right? So we have both math and management. 
And uh, we have worked really well with Ericsson. Uh, I actually have a couple notes here. So by our count, we have 550 uh, of our graduates who, who work at, work at, uh, at Ericsson. And uh, mostly that's in sort of engineering, IT, project and program management, operations and sales. So uh, in essence, we're doing what the founders wanted us to do, which was to produce the sort of talent that companies like Ericsson uh, would, would want to hire. And in fact, two thirds of all of our graduates um, live and work in the Metroplex. So again, we're, we're, we're doing those sorts of things uh, that people had hoped. Um, I also want to say Ericsson has been very good to UTD. So uh, we have a number of, of uh, both scholarships and chairs, all, all with the name Lars Magnus Ericsson. So we have a chair in electrical engineering, one in management. Uh, we have a fellowship in management. Uh, a scholarship in management, and uh, also support of our Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which is one of the real bright spots at UTD. So um, let me just say, uh, Ericsson is a wonderful partner to UTD. I hope you see it the same way as a great uh, partner to Ericsson. And it's, uh, you know, we just, we, we, we love working with you and we're always glad when you want to hire, uh, hire our graduates. So uh, congratulations, well-deserved award. Nice to Nice to be able to congratulate you on that. Thank you so much. And uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for UTD, clearly. I mean, both the geographical location, but also the brilliant talent that we have on the team. So thank you so much for everything you do. And I, I actually believe we're doing some work uh, with some of our employee resource groups, uh, providing internships for some of your minorities as well in STEM. As, as a matter of fact, you are. In fact, those, those ERGs, so to speak, are really important to us. And uh, so thank you very much. That, that is a, a big help uh, for us. I'm very happy about the collaboration and thanks for playing that back to me. You, you never know. The team tells me it goes well. It's uh, more valuable hearing it from you. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you. That is. So um, if you want to uh, pose a question to uh, Nicholas, please go ahead and put it in chat, but I'm going to pick on a few more people here. I'd like to introduce uh, Nicholas, uh, two of my uh, executive committee members. Actually, Barbara is still on my executive committee as past chair of Tech Titans, but Vance McCullough is a partner with the accounting firm of Moss Adams. He's my uh, finance chair and Tad McIntosh with that big American flag behind him, a West Point graduate is uh, my vice chair over membership. Uh, gentlemen, you wanna introduce yourselves real quick? Hi, Nicholas. Uh, this is Tad from Humcap and thank, congratulations again. And I'm, I'm really excited for you and for your company and the growth you're having. Um, it's pretty interesting to me from what it sounds like you really, because of COVID, you guys had planned right. I mean, do you feel smart because you did the plan you did? Or do you feel a little smart and a little lucky based on how you resource manufacturing, the pole climbers? I mean, I'm in the HR and recruiting business, by the way. So it's just kind of interesting to me to hear your talk about those two things. So uh, I think you're spot on. Um, of course, making the bets we did on the center of excellence for tower climbers was uh, a strategic move. We knew we were going to be short of tower climbers. So then I think that has a fair element of uh, uh, good strategic thinking at the factory likewise. But uh, I'll be honest, we, we had no idea we were going to time it so well so that we would hit the inflection point in the curve. So I guess I'll, I'll quote Tiger Woods, right? When uh, a, re an, a reporter walked up to him and said, oh boy, weren't you lucky today? And Tiger Woods turned around to him and said, it's funny how that works. The more I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> well, thank but you, right. veteran. Thank you for hiring those veterans. And uh, thank you for bringing jobs to North Texas for all of our, you know, all of our prosperity in the tech community. So, but thank you very much, Nicholas. Since you're in the recruitment sector, Barbara, let's make sure we keep you connected with our center of excellence because we're constantly hiring. And again, veterans have proven out to be a really, really important uh, category for us. Thank you. Great, great, uh, great opportunity, I think, for both the veterans, but also for us, because we've had high churn in the, in the tower climbing because it's a, it's a risky job, but veterans clearly have the stamina and uh, sort of uh, Exactly. <laughs> well, some of them jump out of planes, so climbing a tower doesn't mm -hmm. sound so bad if you're jumping out of a plane <laughs> with a parachute. So, we brought in Barbara. Keep me honest. We brought in a veteran. She must have been 
this size not didn't look very dangerous. She was sending us, she was live at an all-employee meeting talking about some of her tower climbs, taking pictures on a 700-foot tower. That, uh, I, I wouldn't go up there. So, I mean, it, <laughs> that's some serious, serious stuff. So, it's a different kind of job. So, yes, it, it, that partnership has worked really well for us. Very good. Well, glad to hear of it. Thank you again, and congratulations. Thank you so much. Vance, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Sure, yes. Good afternoon. Uh, Nicholas, congratulations again. Um, as Bill said, my name is Vance McCullough and I'm a partner with Moss Adams here in Dallas. And I, I've been associated with Tech Titans for about 10 years now um, and on the board and executive committee for several of those. You know, I, I just have a, a brief question for you. You mentioned that when you joined um, Ericsson as the North American CEO, you, you described it as a little bit of a turnaround and you empowered your people to go out and find the stupid stuff that was impeding them. How, how did you build trust with your employees uh, to make sure that they would take, that they felt you would take the feedback? That's a very good question because we did have uh, a bit of a culture of fear, very hard top-down management style in sort of earlier regimes. So the team was pretty beaten up and we were not performing either. So the team was pretty beaten up. And, and at the same time, we were doing a lot of crazy stuff, which also wears people out, right? Because they see that and they, they suffer with it. I think what, what uh, works for me, I guess, is um, uh, at the end of the day, pretty simple, uh, down-to-earth kind of guy. What you see is what you get, authentic. I sit down, spent a lot of time just listening to employees. I had... Uh, call it breakfast or, or coffee meetings, 10 employees at the time, no, no managers, just the employees to really get my ears on the ground. And I think it starts spreading when people understand that you're both listening in uh, and you're, you're, not, uh, you're not going after people that are doing something bad. You're trying to understand what the underlying root cause is and you actually try to do something about it. And you talk about it. Uh, at all employee meetings and you bring forward uh, good ideas that employees have, have brought up. Something we haven't perfected, but uh, that we really uh, try to be mindful about is that we also need to celebrate honest uh, mistakes, honest failures. You try something, you break some glass, that's okay, because if you don't try, you don't try hard enough, uh, then you're not going to make errors and, 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 and that either. I, I'd be lying to you if I told you that I'm really proud about how good we are in that category, but that was part of what we talked about. So I think people at the end of the day understood that I was sincere and genuine in my intent. And, uh, and uh, I had a really, really strong leadership team with me that also managed to, to drive that down into the organization. But we obviously had a lot of uncomfortable middle management that did not was not equipped, prepared, trained to maybe deal with that pressure from above and the pull from below. So it wasn't without challenges, but I think uh, what created the momentum is that we had enough successes, uh, enough breakthroughs. We had, I don't know how many hackathons where we celebrated and sort of put forward in, uh, innovation and ideas by employees to do away with some of the stupid stuff we were doing. And we, we had a good uh, good support from the internal communications team broadcasting that. So I think after a while, probably took us a year, I think employees started understanding that this is for real. It's expected. It's encouraged. And if you do an honest mistake, that's also okay. Uh, and uh, I, I think I have, Barbara will keep me honest on, I don't know how many webcasts also told employees that they always have a lifeline because middle management may get uncomfortable from time to time. If there is any repercussions, uh, you pick up the phone and you talk to me. And this is not about me coming after the manager. It's about me greasing the machinery so that we can actually keep, keep going. So I think the cornerstone has been not to come after people that stand in the way or people that try to break something. We just need to be realistic about the fact that this is going to be uncomfortable and try to enable that. That's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one other person before we um, kind of end here in about five or minutes or so. And Tim, are you going to post uh, the link in chat to go to uh, the Brand Live platform? Yes, I'll be sending the link right at 345 for everybody to get over to the show on time. 
Excellent, good. So um, one of the nominees in uh, the category called um, Emerging Company Innovation is a fascinating distributed ledger technology company called Hedera Hashgraph. And their CEO is with us today, Mance Harmon. Uh, Mance and his uh, partner, Lehman Baird, founded this company as an alternative, I guess, maybe I'm taking words out of his mouth, to blockchain. Um, they both taught cybersecurity at the U.S. Air Force Academy. That's how smart they are. And um, Mance, uh, would you just uh, introduce yourself to Nicholas and just talk for just a moment about what the heck is Hedera Hashgraph? And uh, so go ahead. All right. No, well, thank you, Bill. And, and hi, Nicholas. It's very good to meet you here. Um, Hedera Hashgraph is a global public ledger. It competes with the other platforms you, you might have heard of in the, in the industry, Ethereum being the most prominent. What's unique about Hedera is both its technology and its governance model. The tech is not blockchain. It's a superior alternative to blockchain. It solves the same category of problems, but in a much more efficient and secure way. Uh, and then secondly, the governance model. We have a consortium ultimately of 39 global blue chip organizations that are members of the Hedera LLC. So they are Hedera. Uh, it's companies like Google and IBM and Boeing. There are some uh, uh, telecom companies as well. Deutsche Telekom is a member. Tata Communications is in there. We have LG as a handset manufacturer that's a member as well. And uh, they, they provide the governance of this global public distributed ledger. And what that means is that they have oversight of every part of the business at the committee level. They, they uh, you know, have oversight of the product roadmap, treasury management, legal and regulatory, all the major parts of the business. And there's a board of managers that is made up of, of a select group of the council. So um, it's, it's unusual in the industry in that it's focused on enterprise. It does have a cryptocurrency that is critical uh, to the security of the network and the function of the network. And uh, we're here in Dallas. We're, we're happy to be based here in Dallas, uh, Texans now for 15 years. And, uh, and uh, appreciate it, uh, appreciate this opportunity to sort of introduce ourselves and would certainly welcome conversations with anybody on, yeah. on the council here for, for exploring this further. Very interesting. I was not aware, but I made some notes here. I'll uh, follow up with my team. Sounds like very exciting what you guys are up to. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Sounds like you've broken into a little bit of a new opportunity space there with an innovative governance model. That sounds exciting. You know, it was based on the original Visa model. Uh, the the guy that invented or I should say founded Visa, D. Hawk, back in the 60s, wrote a book about his experience. And in that book, he outlined the governance model. And we took it, adopted it, and we're trying to create the intersection of Visa and Amazon Web Services, AWS, for the 21st century. And we've got cool. a good start on it. Man's Interesting. Tell them how many transactions you can process per second versus, uh, say, a yeah. blockchain uh, DOT. Certainly. Well, I mean, if you look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, globally, Bitcoin can process seven, Ethereum 15. Today, in our beta mode, we are processing, we have the capacity for 10,000 uh, transactions wow. per second at a fraction of a cent compared to, you know, dollars for the other platforms. So it, it has the capacity and uh, ability, the cost structure to actually serve as a new set of rails period for, you know, for financial services, but not just financial services, just enterprise class use cases generally, which is what we've been focused on from the beginning. Thanks, Do you know if you've had any contacts with us, Erickson? I don't think we have. Uh, right, we'll, we'll we figure it out. That. Sure. <laughs> I'll ask Bill to connect us and then we'll I'll follow up with you. Sounds great. Very good. Thank All right. Thank you. Nicholas, I want to thank you again for spending uh, time with us in this uh, leadership session. Congratulations on being our CEO of the year. It's a 
you know, it's one for the books. And folks, it is gala time. It's time for you to mix those cocktails and uh, get your uh, party bag out and, you know, your all your stuff and get ready to have some fun. And it's gala time. Take care. Thank Talk you. Talk to you later. Enjoy the gala. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, Bill, good job in there. It's just us left. Uh, good job. That was really good. That was fun. All right. See ya. See ya.